everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Kitten Lady and Friends. It's my interview series where I'm talking to experts in feline welfare, and we are all staying curious about how we can make the world a better place for cats. Um, I am, of course, joined by Coco, my trusty sidekick, and I have a kitten cam with some new babies. Really exciting. These babies are obviously having a, a meal off of their mama there, uh, which is very appropriate for the conversation I'm going to be having today. Uh, not only am I partnering with Royal Canin for this series as part of their Catology uh, series, but I also am joined today by a guest who knows all about nutrition. Her name is Brian Morrow. She is a licensed veterinary technician. She's also a veter veterinary technician specialist in nutrition and she's the nutrition communications lead for Royal Canin, which is my favorite cat food company, and it happens to be Coco's favorite cat food company too. So I'm super excited uh, to have her here. Welcome, Brie. Hi. Hey. Thank you so oh, much I just saw a whisker. Me. Yeah. Who sorry do you have, you have with you? This is Dundee. I mean, never apologize. <laughs> he is uh he is my corn kitten foster uh foster to forever so i was only supposed to foster him but his medical journey uh just we bonded and he's not going anywhere all right okay well that's really exciting well i'm super happy to have you here to talk all about cat nutrition um you have been so helpful for me um, navigating all sorts of different nutritional um, needs and helping me understand everything. And of course, I call you when I have a question about a foster kitten. And um, right now I have a really exciting different type of case. I don't usually take on a lot of moms and babies, but as you can see, I've got this new mama. Her name's Tum Tum. Um, Mama Tum Tum and her babies. So I thought it would be cool to start with like exactly what I have going on right now, which is a nursing mom and babies. Can you talk a little bit about, yeah. you know, starting from the beginning with these moms and babies, what is the nutrition, what's the nutritional content of mama's milk and why is it so good for these little newborn kittens? Yeah, it's great. And I'm so glad to see her take those babies back. And um, it, mama's milk, honestly, is magical, whether it doesn't matter what your species is, um, especially those important first like 12 to 24 hours with the colostrum. And just like in humans milk, it's ever evolving, uh, depending on the phases of lactation and where those kittens are. And so not only does mama's milk provide all the essential nutrients that they need to grow and develop, it also gives them, um, you know, GI support, you know, digestive enzyme support and their initial kind of immune system. So it's, it's irreplaceable. Um, and I'm just, it, it just warms my heart to, to see her, you know, being able to be able to make those connections. Um, there are, you know, recipes out there for milk replacers that you can make at home. But in all honesty, it, the protein ends up being lowered, the calories, it, it's just never enough. And we want to set our kittens up, like what we feed our kittens sets them up to be adult cats um, and live those healthier lives. So, you know, there's nothing that compares quite to, you know, the milk from a mama cat or a queen. Um, you know, you can use kitten formula that's ideal if you don't have, uh, you know, a mama cat, but, um, you know, there's nothing like getting it straight from the source. Sure. I totally agree with that. And I was really, really happy that, you know, in this situation, these kittens came to me as orphans and then... Mm -hmm like 24 hours later, um, the mom came into the picture. She came into a spay neuter clinic from the same neighborhood. And so we were able to reunite her with her babies. And, you know, I spend so much of my time working with kittens who are formula fed bottle babies. And of course you can, you can simulate mother's milk to a certain extent, but you're never going to have the same experience as the real thing. I mean, is there anything yeah. that you can share about kind of what goes into kitten formulas and maybe some of the dangers of trying to do any kind of homemade diet at home versus going with something that's a prepared formula? 
Yeah, I think from um, my expertise side, I'm not, all right, let's not eat the paper. Um, <laughs> intermission. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's, you know, where my expertise is, is not really like the science behind formulating uh, the formula and how those experts kind of do that magic in being able to provide kittens the most appropriate nutrition as we can. Um, but what I can speak to is those, you know, the homemade recipes are, you know, going to be lacking in the calories and specifically the fat as well, which kittens need for that energy as, you know, they they grow so fast. I mean, this thing was a completely different beast three days ago. <laughs> um, whereas I also have had, I don't know if you've encountered this also, but people trying to use cow's milk or goat's milk, like other species Ugh. and, <laughs> And, you know, and to be completely honest, it's completely inappropriate. They're, they're rumnants, first of all. So, they, you know, they're omnivores and it, it is, you know, it's just severely lacking and we're just risking GI disease. We're risking um, digestion issues, compromising their growth and development. And then some of that stuff is irreversible um, as far as damage goes. So, you know, it's just mission critical to provide those you know, the amount, the appropriate amount of protein, the appropriate amount of fat and calories. And I get it, you know, emergencies happen and maybe you don't have it, you know, kitten milk replacer at hand or the mom is not available. Well, you know, we don't want to do the other species milk. If you have to, you could potentially do a homemade recipe. And then immediately, as soon as that store opens up, get yourself an appropriate, you know, kitten milk replacer formula. Um, just because there's just, it's so, there's so much behind it. It's not, it's not just as easy as mixing a few ingredients at home and calling it good. There's variation and everybody measures ingredients different. So there's just, there's too much room for error for these tiny little lives to put at risk. I really appreciate what you said because, um, you know, I see a lot uh, of a lot of horrifying things out there. People trying to feed their kittens something that they just have laying around in yeah. the fridge. And whether you're talking about a bottle baby or a weaning kitten or an adult cat, I mean, the things that you have in your fridge for human consumption are not necessarily going to meet the nutritional needs of a cat. So I want to um, kind of move ahead in kitten development now. So after a baby has, you know, been with mom or has been a bottle baby, they start weaning. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the nutritional needs of kittens as, as opposed to adult cats, because you don't want to take, you know, your five, six, seven, eight week old kittens and feed them, um, you know, adult cat food. Um, so what right. is it in kitten food that makes it kitten food? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> and so what, kitten food is, and I, and I get where this is coming from, is yes, it would be easier if we could feed them one thing for their whole life. Nobody likes change, right? Um, but if you think about it, we change our nutritional needs. You know, none of us are still nursing or eating purees or, or any of that. And so we have to set them up for their future. And feeding a diet that's specifically formulated for a kitten is truly going to set them up for success. Just knowing that first off, kittens grow for, you know, 12 months, unless, you know, Maine Coons are big old gentle giants, they grow a little bit longer for 15 months. And we need to support that nutrition. Again, as you see, and, you know, flipping through any of your photos, like kittens change overnight, like they look like somebody replaced your cat. Um, <laughs> and so when it comes to their nutrition, they need more protein, more fat, different levels of vitamins and minerals than a healthy adult cat. Um, and we have to be able to supply that because if we have excesses or deficiencies in vitamins or nutrients, um, again, that can be irreversible at times, um, you know, and what we want to make certain that that growth is there is you can easily determine that on a pet food label if you flip it over and there'll be an AFCO feeding guideline saying it's either formulated for or done feeding tests that substantiate growth. Um, not all life stages. I do personally prefer diets that are specifically for kittens, because again, if we're mixing in multiple life stages, I just get concerned about 
where are we crossing a line and on the nutritional levels that they're getting, especially when it comes to those amino acids that they need and the brain development and the body, just overall body development is trying to set them up for the most success. I really want to make certain that people use a kitten food and not ads, ah, you know, all my cats eat this. It's fine. Um, I get it. It's so sure. much easier, <laughs> um, but it's worth right. going for the growth and then starting to establish good eating behaviors too um, with that food as far as getting them used to, you know, as their babies, yes, we, you know, ad lib feed them, but then start doing meals and getting them used to those healthy behaviors again to prevent that feline or kitten obesity is a big thing and a, and a growing problem these days as I see more and more consults of, hey, I need a weight loss on this nine month old kitten already. Um, and wow. so again, making certain that we're feeding the kitten, not the bowl and uh, using that food for growth. Something that you taught me uh, that I didn't, I feel so silly that I didn't know before is that there are even different stages of the nutritional needs of kittens, like once they're weaned, it's not like they just eat kitten food and then they eat adult food. There's actually like young kitten food and then there's ki kitten food for kittens who are like over four months. So can you talk about like what changes between, because there's that period of rapid growth, right? Like for the mm -hmm. zero to four month period is just like boom, 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 boom. And then you get to the four yeah. month old cat and you've got kind of this lanky a little bit more slow development um, cat who is still a kitten. So what's the difference and, you know, what should people be looking for in terms of uh, when they transition from that early kitten food diet to the older kitten food diet? Yeah. And that's a great point. Not a lot of um, companies do provide multiple phase kitten development growth diets. And that's, um, you know, I really appreciate Royal Canin, not just as an associate, but just because they're thinking about their needs and stages. So, you know, the referencing that mother and baby cat formula is being able to, when they don't have teeth or they're starting to develop teeth, you know, the rehydratable kibble, it's smaller, um, the GI support, transitioning though to the kitten formula which is the larger size kibble but as we discussed before like we have that spayed neutered kitten diet and we're like where why do we have that and even as a veterinary technician before i started I'm like i don't understand why there's so many options but you know when they're spayed and neutered to decrease you know all those unwanted kittens and you know no more homelessness for cats which is ideal uh is you know their hunger goes up their metabolism goes down so there's that imbalance right and they can sing you the song of their people all night long like my bowl is empty you're starving me <laughs> um this little guy bites my ankles i have the marks to prove it uh and so being able to give them some different fibers to make them feel fuller longer you know to kind of ease that transition for them as they you know as they adjust as they're growing is is going to be great to again prevent that feline obesity problem that we are seeing you know globally um but also for their phases of development right they have this big structure growth phase and then they get like you said they turn into those lanky teenagers um as they start to layer on the muscle and so then not only do they need the energy for maintenance to keep themselves you know going but they also have to start layering on that tissue growth and development and so we have to fuel that and that takes quite a bit of energy for them so those diets are subs you know i'm saying you know a lot but they are layered onto that factor and nutritionally balanced for that like it compensates like okay he's going to use a lot of this to go and play and chase things and all this but Oh yeah, by the way, he's also gonna have to develop some better, you know, hind end muscles or start to fill in that lankiness so he doesn't just look like, you know, the giraffe on skates, um, as sometimes some of this one over here underneath my desk is looking like. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, Another thing that I think a lot of kitten people deal with um, that has to do with nutrition is 
the D word, diarrhea. Yeah. And I know yes. that you don't just have like professional experience with this. You also have personal experience <laughs> dealing with kittens and diarrhea. So I have all of these cute pictures you sent of Dundee. I know you have Dundee next to you, but let's look at some of yeah. Dundee's pictures. And you can um, tell me a little bit about like your journey your diarrhea journey with Dundee <laughs> and uh, what what happened and how did you deal with that? Yeah, so um, so Dundee was found at a barn pole. Um, so up here in uh, upstate New York, we have often a lot of barns and everybody tends to, oh, it's a barn. I'm just going to drop this cat off here. Um, and, you know, Farmers do their best, um, but litters happen. And so we were there uh, with the rescue that I um, helped foster and consult with and found this little beautiful orange kitten in the gutter of the cow germ barn. Brought him home. He had a horrific URI, of course, so an upper respiratory infection. Um, his eyes weren't quite sure the condition of them. So, of course, we started him on antibiotics. Um, you know, we're trying to get him stabilized. We had quite a few um, close calls in the first 48 hours with him. And there he is. And um, he actually had a solid poop after 48 hours. I'm like, ah, oh, this is, this is magical. This never happens, right? Well, I cursed myself <laughs> by saying that. <laughs> and <laughs> I literally cursed myself. The last day of his antibiotics just, um, we had just gastrointestinal nightmare of a situation. It was on my walls. It was on the layers of, you know, his enclosure uh, where you want a squeegee. Um, he went into hypoglycemic <laughs> shock from it. So we ah. immediately went, yeah, there it is in its glory, right? Oh my God. Um, so we immediately went to the ER uh, with him and started doing, you know, of course, like with diarrhea, I always say fecal, 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 fecal. There's different route life cycles and parasites and, and everything like that, especially with kittens. And so, we, of course, we dewormed him and everything, but his stool wasn't getting better. So I gave it about 36 hours and I said, OK, you know what? We've done the medical side. Now let's get some nutrition involved because you worry about dehydration with these guys and all. I mean, that's a lot of energy to brew that mess, right? So I did start him on a kitten gastrointestinal diet. And I mean, just look at the magic within, you know, 12 hours to 24 hours to 36 hours. It was an easy scoop finally. Um, and honestly, I couldn't believe it um, because this is a newer uh, diet for us that's specifically for kittens. I, it, it, this company never ceases to amaze me or shock me, but just to see how fast there was, you know, consistency to his stool, he bounced back. Um, there he is when he finally had a good, <laughs> good fecal score. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Everything gosh. I mean, you did a great job with him. I'm so um, proud of Dundee for how far he's come. And I can't tell you how much I relate to these like GI journeys that you go on when you're either fostering or adopting a kitten. Um, for me, my most recent case, you know very well because you're the person who helped me through it, which was <laughs> James. James was my foster kitten who had the opposite problem. He had um, yeah. severe constipation. And like when you look at the x-rays of James, it's like, it's it's horrifying. I mean, he's like completely backed up, totally obstipated. And he had to go to the hospital. He had to go through all of, I mean, just was horrible. He had to go through deobstipation, multiple enemas, and nothing was moving. And I'm I'm more used to what you were going through with the diarrhea. With this, I was like, how do I get, you know, because we wanted everything to be softer. So what's amazing to me is this food that you gave Dundee, that's also what you told me to give to James. And it completely saved him. Like the GI kitten diet, first of all, he loved it. Like he would go absolutely bananas for it. And once he didn't need it anymore, he was like kind of sad because he was like, wait, I love the GI diet. <laughs> but I was like, James, you're fine now. You don't need it anymore. And he's like, mm, but yeah. please. Uh, but look how beautiful he is now. I mean, he, he oh. doesn't have that full hard belly anymore. He was able to have like just a normal consistency to his stool. Um, so can you talk about like, how does the GI kitten diet, which I didn't even know existed until his case, 
How does that also help? Because it helps obviously with like keeping their stool more firm like you showed, but how does it also help with helping them be regular if they are constipated? Yeah, so with kittens, they don't, um, when kittens are developing, they explore everything with their mouths, right? However, their GI tract, uh, the immune system in their GI tract isn't fully established. And so that, that takes a little bit more time. It's being able to provide nutrients in a diet, so ingredients or nutrients in a diet that can help with that GI immune system helps kind of just, I like to say like the motions in the ocean. So getting them to go to the bathroom more regularly, right? Uh, being able to promote like a good healthy fecal score, but just creating that good yin and yang in their GI tract and, you know, not to oversimplify it, but it does, it does happen. We all have seen commercials like Activia, right? <laughs> and you <laughs> go more regularly. Uh, but that that is uh, probiotics. The prebiotics are naturally occurring fibers like FOS. And so that's uh, fructolegiosaccharides. And you could see it written out in all this letter glory on the back of an ingredient bag. But you could also see chicory uh, or inulin in a pet food. And what this does is it creates an environment where good bacteria want to thrive. So it acidifies the GI tract, making an environment where good bacteria want to hang out, kind of feeding them or um, what I like to teach uh, my students, like feed the friendlies, right? So FOS feeds the friendly bacteria. So that the bad bacteria, you know, they just they just can't um, they can't cause havoc or overpopulate there. Um, and that that I find it, it's so simple. Uh, but not, it's not um, used by every single company out there. I mean, there's so many companies out there, but that's like part of the magic of the gastrointestinal diets is creating, you know, soothing the gut, not only soothing it, but restoring that balance and fueling that immune system because a lot of your immune system starts in your gut. And so creating that, and so with James, it was magical to help with the digestibility. His body didn't have to work so hard. You know, he already has... Um, his his uh, abilities, right, to use his front legs more than his, um, you know, his little his nub or his lack of the hind his end. Nubs. So how do <laughs> so how do we help his GI tract become more mobile as he is moving, right? Because the same thing in people who are not as ambulatory as you have, um, you can have, you know, decreased motility in your gut. So how do we teach his gut to move a little bit better as he's learning, right? Because he has to learn too, how do I move? And, you know, man, I was watching some of his videos and you guys did such an awesome job with the stairs and his routines and his exercise. Like that all plays a huge role in, in everything. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you're totally right. It was like that diet was what got him through the period where he didn't have a lot of mobility. And so it was like yeah. he needed other things to be working for him, um, his diet. He also needed some like medical support to just like keep everything moving, but also make it like nice and firm because of course you didn't want him like it to be too loose because he's like, dra you know, dragging himself around. It yeah. was just incredible. And I have to say like, that obviously, you know, it's a veterinary diet. It's not just a diet that anybody can just go grab for their cat. But these Maybe. veterinary diets, they're, they're so good to have for these difficult cases. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about what is the value of having different veterinary diets? Um, and I think specifically urinary diets are something a lot of people have questions mm -hmm. about. Um, what is what is like a diet that you would recommend for um, those for those types of cases and what's the value of having kind of this line of different veterinary diets yeah um it is hard for some for to understand it took me a while too as i was new to veterinary medicine and being a technician as far as what was the difference between a diet you could just get over the counter and a diet that was at the veterinary office or noted as like a therapeutic diet that you can only get from your veterinarian. And when it comes to like lower urinary tract disease, like you mentioned, for cats, cats are 
very predisposed to or are frequent flyers in having lower urinary tract disease. So when it comes to to those like with lower urinary tract disease, nutrition can actually tackle, um, you know, peeing outside of the litter box. Um, there is nutrition out there and it's there's a lot of science behind it. And that's the power of a therapeutic diet is being able to do the research. We're able to scientifically formulate a diet outside on top of the regular guidelines for cat nutrition is also add in extra science to kind of counterbalance, support their urinary tract health. And it's it's just all in all, like there's more science behind it, a lot of research. Um, there's added nutritional value and nutrients that are utilized and just the opportunities that are out there. Like you had mentioned, like with James's GI kitten diet, but if James was an adult and constipated, I would recommend a completely different diet that would kind of help lubricate his intestinal tract so that the um, so the stool didn't hang out. So I would use a diet called feline fiber response that would help kind of help his GI motility. So it's we would go differently. I think it's interesting. Nutrition is not exactly black and white. It's like rainbows and glitter and confetti guns um, because I have a different answer for every patient. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, with the urinary um, infections, which are so unfortunately common in cats. Yeah. There's, you know, there's dietary things you can do. And then there's also like a, a litter additive thing that I would love to hear about that you were telling me about. What, what yeah. is that? Yeah, right on. So sending, you know, we already know bringing cats to the vet can be a challenge. And what we can do is uh, Royal Canin will be launching this fall. And it's called hematuria detection um, technology by Blue Care. And it's, you don't have to change your cat's litter, which is the coolest thing because I have had cats that are very specific about what litter they're going to use and they will boycott the box for until I bring back the old stuff. But it is actually a little packet. Um, it will come in this and it's a packet that you'll sprinkle right on top of your box. And what it will do is if your cat has any type of um, blood in their urine, it'll turn blue, indicating that you need to call your veterinarian and it's and, and um, you know bring them in or tell them what you're detecting. It's a great way for owners, cat owners, to have some control in this. Sometimes it seems uncontrollable nature of, you know, oh my goodness, when are they going to have a flare of inflammation or what's going on with them? So it's nice to have be able to do something as a pet owner in monitoring their cats at home. And again, it's through your veterinarian. So often it's gonna be leveraged if they already have had a lower urinary tract issue, um, like blood in the urine or you know any type of um, lower urinary tract disease. But it's a great opportunity to not have you waiting and holding your breath for an issue at hand. Um, because as soon as you see that blue, you know, okay, something's off kilter here and I need to bring him into the vet for, you know, whether it's another urinalysis, but again, it's going to take away that, all right, let's bring him to the vet, have a urinalysis pulled. I don't know if there's an issue. If it's blue, you know, you have an issue and we have, we have to take action. Well, that's really, really interesting. I can't wait to try that. Um, so <laughs> I want to, I want to talk about, um, something that is a big question for me, which is food preference for cats, mm. because I have three cats of my own. And then obviously I have like a whole bunch of foster kittens and everybody has different food preferences. Some of my cat, you know, like I have a cat who only wants to eat wet. I have a cat who prefers dry. I have cats who prefer different flavors of things. Um, so there's, you know, clearly there's there's diets that are designed for the specific needs of the cats, but then there's also what the cat wants. So how does how do cat taste buds work? Like how do they develop their food preferences? What can they taste? Um, why do they have these different ideas of what they like? Yeah, it can be it can be a circus trying to find exactly what your cat's preference is, <laughs> and and it's all it's a little bit more than a taste because when it comes to taste buds, they have a completely different amount than dogs and humans. Um, in fact, they only have a few hundreds. So they have like a, a little bit over four hundred uh, taste buds, whereas humans have over nine thousand. 
And what's interesting to me is that cats have non-functional sugar taste receptors. Now, you couldn't fool me because Dundee definitely knows when I have ice cream out of the refrigerator, out of the freezer. <laughs> like he will just come careening in to check it out. But it's more about, um, it's less about like what it tastes like and more kind of transitioning into what is the, what's the aroma? How does it texture, the texture that feels in your mouth? And I always like to attribute it as like, what's your favorite M&M? And in like a group of people, I always ask them like, what's your favorite M&M? Some like the original. I prefer the crispy one. So I'm apparently a dry food kibble cat um, <laughs> versus others like, you know, maybe they don't like it at, like M&Ms at all. And they would rather a chocolate bar. So maybe they are more of a canned food type of a cat. Um, so it's really interesting when it goes towards taste is that we're also taking into consideration the aroma, the size and shape of the kibble. Uh, again, some cats like wet food, but they absolutely won't eat the morsels and gravy because it's more, they like more of that softer texture. And that's again, when it goes back to taste, how does it feel in their mouth? Um, so it, it is a fine science. Uh, that's where why there's luckily a lot of palatins and we do so much research on proteins to attract them to eat and encourage them to eat. Uh, but yeah, it's not like a one size fits all. And that's why, you know, thankfully there are so many diets out there on the market um, to again, hopefully hit every single cat. So sorry, my cat's <laughs> not gonna stop over. <laughs> She's like, I just wanted to say that my food preference, actually <laughs> Coco's food preference is to try new stuff. She, <laughs> I'm sorry, she just barged in to interrupt, but her, her food preference is like, she wants to be trying new, new things all the time. And, um, she'll like do something for a while and then be like, okay, give me something else. And that was mm -hmm. a question I had too, is like, if, if a, I, I always hear you want to be careful about transitioning diets, but why is that? Because, you know, a human, we eat, you know, I have tacos one night and the next night I have pizza and the night after that mm -hmm. I have Chinese or whatever it is. Um, how careful do we need to be about giving cats? Oh my gosh, Coco, come here, girl. You, she wants to, she's trying to close up all the programs. Come here. Coco. She's reorganizing. <laughs> she is. So what would you say to Coco, uh, my darling Coco, who wishes that she could, you know, have a different thing every night of the week? What would you say about that yeah. or transitioning diet? Well, Coco has a tummy like a tank if she's not experiencing any uh, gastrointestinal distress. And I think that's really where we shy away from recommending changing diets often is some cats need a very slow transition. It could take a week. It could take a 10 days. My cat, Abe, it took him a month to transition to something else. Otherwise, we were dealing with vomiting, diarrhea. And that could cause food aversion in, you know, later on is when you try to go and offer that, they're like, mm, nope, I'm not doing it. Um, I do like owners to encourage their kittens to try different textures of foods. So encouraging them to try canned foods and then try a dry, just so if later in their life, their nutritional needs change and say they need a therapeutic diet that is canned or is only dry, that is not stranger danger because they are creatures mm. of habit sometimes. And even like I changed Dundee's bowl and it went from, I have like a little Disney cat play and I used a little red saucer and he just sat there. And I'm like, it's not gonna explode, <laughs> it's, it's like safe. <laughs> I'm like, it's safe, it's the same food, but it was a different bowl. And it was just so funny to see it in action. It, it's it's always a great reminder and humbling to see to see those things in action. I'm like, okay, it's not exploding. It's a safe plate. I go get the his normal plate, put the food on it, and he was fine. So now I have to change the plates with him um, more often. But again, if we have to change their nutrition along their life, it's great to have it not be such a stranger danger moment for them. So they, they understand there is wet food and they understand there's dry food. And this is what that felt in my mouth and it was okay. And it was safe and I didn't die. Um, and so, you know, I do encourage them, you know, kitten owners to at least offer it to them at least a couple times. So they recognize it and it's not so scary if their needs change or, or whatnot in the future for adults. I always say, just make sure to go slow. 
when you're transitioning because the last thing we want to cause is gastrointestinal um, upset. And then with cats, like, you know, it, they, they get stressed out about that they're pooping. And so it's stress poop on top of regular gastrointestinal diarrhea. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm like, is it worth the risk? You know, going slow. Some cats refuse to transition. So you open up one thing and they dive right in and like, ah, oh, forget about the old food. And they're not going to transition. So they're going to naturally cause them, their tummies to get upset. Or they can be tanks and they're totally fine. Um, I just... I assess the risk with that. Um, and I, I'm a little gun shy and I'm like, all right, we're just going to keep, life is good. We're going to keep everything the way it is unless they start becoming finicky and then I'll change it up or change the bowl apparently with Dundee. <laughs> you know, I think Coco is, she's my oldest cat. She was my first cat ever. And I remember very, very clearly like the feeling of um, you know, getting a cat and not knowing like what on earth I was doing with feeding this cat. She probably is a tank because I tried like a hundred different foods with her when she was a baby because I didn't know what to do. And that's a question that I wanted to ask you about is like, if you're a new cat person, you, you know, you've got a cat, mm -hmm. you don't really know what they, you know, they need cat food, but you don't really know what kind of cat food. When you go to the store and there's like this wall of bags and cans and pouches and everything, like, yeah. I literally, I think I told you this, I literally used to just go and just be like, well, like, I like the branding of that one. And maybe that I don't mm -hmm. like, I just did, I had no idea. This was like 11 years ago. I was like, that one has a bobcat on it. That seems cool. I'll get the one with the bobcat. It's great. You know, I mean, I just had no idea what I was doing. Of course, now I know a little bit more, but can you talk about like for new cat people, mm -hmm. how should they, what should they be thinking about when they're looking at the wall of cat food what should they be thinking about? Is it about price? Is it about flavor? Is it about texture? Is it about reading the label? Um, what's your advice? All of the above. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not the not the picture on the bag, though, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is completely overwhelming keeping up with how many diets are there. I mean, there are even aisles, multiple aisles of treats now for cats, let alone aisles for, for diets. So it's completely overwhelming. Um, the first thing I always ask uh, pet owners, and it relies on the um, World Small Animal Veterinary Association, so we name it Wasava, and they have great tips on the for free on their website. But what they kind of go after is, um, first off, is asking them, is it safe? So do you know their safety standards? Um, and every company should tell you, and if they don't tell you, hang up and you know move on if, when you're doing your research is is it safe the next one is, is is it nutritious so what that means is is it complete and balanced for that cat's life stage so is it for kittens is it for an adult and then is it for that pet so is it right for your cat so if you have an indoor cat or your cat is gaining a little bit more weight or is prone to hairballs well then that's when we can raise the bar and use more precise nutrition. There are thousands of diets out there and you can you can really give them a targeted diet for their cat just by asking yourselves those questions like is it safe? Is it um, you know nutritious for them and is it right for my cat? Um, because again, it is overwhelming. The internet all tells different stories. There are great websites out there that actually have done some of the work for you as far as understanding what a company's safety standards are. Do they employ boarded nutritionists and PhDs in nutrition full-time, not just on a consulting basis? Is there somebody there always advocating for science and what's best for the cat, um, you know, and then those safety standards? So if you're comfortable with those, that's where I start reducing my aisles I'm you know and it's not like oh this aisle is the safe aisle this aisle's not they're they're all intermixed with each other but just being a little obsessive about nutrition and you know nobody wants their pet food to be recalled nobody makes pet food to be recalled but I want to make certain that I know and they're transparent about their safety standards and what they do to make certain that my cat's getting the best nutrition so you taught me something a while ago that blew my mind. And <laughs> I guarantee most of the people watching this do not know how to read a cat food label. 
I didn't even know what went into cat food labels. And suddenly you like decoded the entire cat food aisle for me. And now I feel like the <laughs> secret agent who totally understands everything. Can you talk? And I even brought, I brought a can of, this is obviously, this is the food I feed my kittens, the mother and baby mm -hmm. cat. And I didn't even know it has this little, look at this. Yes. This is all information on the back. And I was like, this is like a secret scroll that I, did. I never <laughs> even knew this was here. And I can learn so much. And there's like all this information. So, um, you know, your labels are really, the Royal Canaan labels are awesome. They're so, there's so much information here. But can you talk more broadly and like explain what you explained to me before about reading even just the name of cat food, like what can you learn just by looking at the bag? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is, is a pet food label is a legal document. So there are actually rules and guidelines behind it and requirements that actually have to be on the label. What's funny though, is the graphics do not need to be required. So there's so many pretty pictures, like you mentioned, bobcats and rainbows, you know, I'm a big fan, rainbows and glitter. I'm like, here we go, I'll use this one. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I'm totally sold <laughs> when it comes to pretty, right? Um, but when it comes to pet food labels, especially when it comes to like the diet name. So if a company is naming a diet after like an ingredient, so if it is chicken and rice, that name is giving you an indicator of what percentage of that diet is actually those two ingredients. So it's calling attention to them. And there are rules around um, what you can name it. The most common rule, which you and I laughed about, is like when you see dinner, entree, stew, or recipe, or formula after it. So if it just says chicken and rice dinner, that means that chicken and rice equal 25% up to 94.9% .9 of that diet's, you know, components. Versus if it just said chicken and rice on it, well, that's 95%. However, if I have breeze, breeze diet and it's with chicken and rice, it now drops down to each one of those equal 3%. So 3% chicken, 3% rice. So that's telling, it's calling attention to a certain ingredient in a pet food. Um, and they're following the rules which indicate the level of amount, but oftentimes we assume as humans. So if I see chicken feast or salmon feast, I'm thinking this is all salmon, right? Um, but that feast is indicating 25%, you know, up to that next rule, which is 95%. So turn the can around and look at that ingredient deck because you may be thinking you're only giving your cat one type of protein, but there could be others in there. It's just not what they're naming the diet after. So it could be salmon, but there may be chicken meal in that or, you know, uh, beef or turkey or so on and so forth. And especially with cats with adverse reactions to food, we want to be careful um, when it comes to, you know, the diet name and what's in there to not elicit that response. Right. Okay. My next uh, topic, controversial nutrition topic is grains and fruits and vegetables in cat food. There are people who say cats should only eat a diet of meat. And then there are people who say cats need some amount of grains, fruits, vegetables in their food. So um, what would you say about that? Yeah, that's a lot of hot topics on one. It kind of needs like horror music behind it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so cats and grains, the biggest nutritional truth, just to squish it right out there, is that grain-free diets often contain alternative sorts of carbohydrates. So I feel that oftentimes pet owners think a grain-free diet will therefore be low carb, right? So no carbs for cats. But it's not necessarily true because those the grain-free diets, you know, so no corn in that diet because corn has a bad reputation, um, will have potatoes or beans or other legumes as a source of carbohydrate to make that kibble. And there's a lot of studies out there that measure, you know, is there any difference on a macronutrient profile? So does it matter protein, carbohydrate, or fat level? And what they're finding is oftentimes they have the same levels of protein, fat, and carbohydrates with or without grain. Um, I think a lot of the grains come from maybe they have an allergy. 
again, cats are more prone to having allergies to uh, animal sources. So, you know, your beef, your fish, your chicken, um, not necessarily your soy or your rice. Um, fruits and veggies, that's always a great hot topic because they say, oh, you have to have fruits and veggies in the diet because you have to have natural sources of vitamins and minerals. And they are feel good ingredients. And yes, they are carnivores, um, so, but they do need vitamins and minerals. So how are we going to provide them? And so you can provide them through uh, chelated vitamins and minerals. So they, they are synthetic, but it's just like if you take a vitamin, I take a vitamin. When you look at the back of it, of your vitamin thing, it doesn't say, oh, this vitamin's from cranberries or kelp or, or whatnot. It'll say exactly, you know, the mind source or it's been chelated so that that cat can absorb it. And that's okay because we want them to get all the nutrients. Um, they don't particularly need apples. They don't need carrots. Um, but what they do need are the nutrients from there. So whether it's coming from natural sources or, you know, your chelated form, um, I'm down as long as it's complete and balanced. Okay, so so much to unpack here. I I know um, really I appreciate a lot of what you just said, and I'm gonna go to the maybe weirdest question I'm gonna ask you. Um, so you know you mentioned that cats don't need apples and uh, you know vegetables uh, necessarily, but they do need the um, nutrition that that you know the vitamins that come from those things. When I think about it, I think you know a cat in the wild, a wild cat would be eating, um, you know, whole, whole mm. herbivore animals. So the, the herbivores that they would be consuming, they themselves are consuming the apple or the vegetable or whatever it is, uh, mm. because cats are carnivores. Now I am vegan. I've been vegan for more than half my life. And every yeah. single time that someone finds out I'm vegan, they go, well, are your cats vegan? And I get asked, can your cats be vegan? Or you're not one of those people who feeds vegan cat food. And I just, I could like faint from how horrifying the thought of vegan cat. I mean, there is no vegan cat food. That's an oxymoron. But I want to hear from a specialist. I want to hear from a nutritionist. Why cat, can cats be vegan? Why can't they be vegan? Uh, let's put this whole thing to rest. Okay. And I'll do it nicely. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the reasons why somebody makes the decision, a human makes the decision to become vegetarian or vegan, you know, it ranges, right, um, for, for their personal choice. And it, it's a very diverse decision. However, the reason a cat becomes vegetarian or vegan is because we're putting on our beliefs onto them, right? And it's a disaster. It's a recipe for disaster because they need meat. You know, they need the amino acids that are being provided, that protein source. And, you know, it's just such a risk. Um, I understand the passions and behind being vegan or vegetarian, and I completely respect it, but we also have to respect that our cats are not humans. And we have to feed these cats like cats and their nutritional requirements are completely different than ours. So I always just guide them and say, I respect your choice, but you have to respect your cat's choice of being a carnivore and that's who they need to be. And we need to support that. You know, I think you really said it. And I fully feel like for me, veganism is a choice I make because I love and respect animals. And part of mm -hmm. loving and respecting animals is knowing and recognizing that my cats only have the food that I provide to them. You know, my cats are indoor cats. They're not going to be out there hunting any bunny rabbits or something like that. Right. So, you know, I have to give them a diet that is complete for them. And I tell people, if you don't want to feed meat to an animal, like that's okay. Just adopt an animal who doesn't need to be fed meat. You know, there are plenty of guinea pigs who need homes. There are plenty of rabbits yes. who need homes. There are plenty of wonderful animals who are herbivores who need homes but if you are gonna have a cat you're going to be feeding them a meat-based diet so I appreciate your backup on this one I really do <laughs> right on yeah I <laughs>
Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all these kind of like specialty diets that are like fads that come and go to. And I wonder if you can speak to that. Like, is that something you see people doing a lot, taking their own diets, whether they're like paleo or something like trying to force that on their cats? And, and what would you say to people who are thinking about taking their own diets and sort of pushing that onto their cat? Yeah, I really um, try to lean on just the way I answered the vegetarian. I do get um, keto is a, is growing in trends, you know, or fads. Um, and oftentimes what we feed our cats spills over from human trends, right? The trend of keto, the, tr the, the trend of paleo. Uh, that was always great when people are trying to feed their cats like cavemen. Um, cats were never little cavemen. Um, <laughs> and so I try to make a joke about it because when it comes to nutrition, let's, it, it's a passion. Nobody feeds their cat one way or another to cause harm. And in rescue, as you know, there are people who, who there are horrible situations where cats are emaciated and, and neglect cases. So I respect anybody who's making a choice to feed their cat and just try to gently guide them again on, you know, these are your preferences and the trends that are going on in, in human nutrition. However, you know, a, a cat is a cat and they have different, you know, they have different needs than you, than your son, than your dog. Um, you know, than any of the anybody anything else and so we have to feed a cat for who they are because if we don't feed them now appropriately that just that that spills over later on in their life too so if we want to fuel and have our cats i mean i want dundee to live forever and i'm going to do everything i can in my power to keep him going till the end of time um and so start it off right with nutrition because nutrition fuels every part of your body um, and so giving them the right nutrition to fuel that helps later on in their life. And so I just try to gently coax them that way. Again, always respecting the fact that they are making choices that they feel are the best for their pet because that's what, you know, they've researched or that makes them feel good. But again, leaning on the fact that they're cats, they're not humans, um, is, is normally where I, I try to lean on. So I am with you about wanting your cats to live forever. I am always like, oh, Coco's going to live to be like 100 years old, uh, which of <laughs> course I would love. I'm sitting here. I know you can't see her, but I'm looking at her right now. She ser seriously sits by my side like the entire time I'm doing these interviews. She's so sweet. Um, I would love to use just the last couple minutes to talk to you about the diets that I have my cats on and get just like download your brain about why these diets are doing such good work for my cats because yeah. well, I'll start with Eloise. Eloise, my white one-eyed, very shy cat, um, she has been on a lot of different diets, but for gosh, like several, many months now, four or five months now, she's been on the Royal Canin Calm Diet. And I've never <laughs> seen, I've never seen this cat transform in such a short period of time like I have since she's been on this diet. Um, Eloise is, I mean, she is much more um, accepting of other cats and kittens of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, different sounds of um, going into a room that has something unfamiliar in it. Uh, a lot of things that were scary to her. Now she is genuinely more calm about, and I'm like, what is this diet is like awesome. So can you talk to me about like, what is in the calm diet that is like changing my cat's life? Because it's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Thank you for that feedback. I, I always joke that calm is like our easiest diet name. <laughs> as far yeah, as when you it, it works. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the easiest name out there. And when it was coming, um, I was with the company when calm was coming out. I'm like, really? Like, how is this working? Because it gets the wheels like, is it going to sedate my cat? Like, what medication is in here? But it's not. It's yeah. leveraging nutrients. So we're leveraging... Um, hydrolyzed milk protein and tryptophan, right? So we've all, you know, like anybody who has, you know, overindulged in a Thanksgiving feast or supplements with um, L-tryptophan for sleep supplements as well. Um, those actually help with the serotonin levels, again, to make you feel more calm and more appeased. And 
I have to say it's it's magical. And I think one of our best kept secrets in our arsenal of diets, especially for cats, because there's oftentimes there could be, you could introduce a cat and there's a bully cat in your household or change is hard for them. And a stressed cat is not, you know, their welfare. I'm always concerned about cat feline welfare and wanting them to be able to be cats and go through their environment without, you know, jumping off of all fours and puffing out and hissing and running away. Um, so with just using nutrients, we're able to help make a cat feel more comfortable. Um, be, you know, we're able to help with some behavioral issues. Of course, you need to do your desensitization and, you know, um, get them, you, you know, keep exposing them and watch how it goes. But it's pretty magical to see the transformation. And it does help also with those secondary stress conditions that can happen with cats. So stress cats can over groom. So we do have um, some hairball support in that diet as well. And, you know, it does promote healthy bladder um, health additionally, because we know with stress comes, you know, just like humans, sometimes stressed humans can get lower urinary tract infections or, you know, cystitis. And, um, you know, we don't need that to be happening uh, additionally, but it is a really cool diet. And I'm so glad uh, that Eloise really was just watching the kitten train. <laughs> I know. I was like, it was like, you gotta, we gotta look at the like, kittens wait, for I a second. Oh, know. I think she's Where going to get one. There's one missing. She probably is walking off to go. Whoa, look. Oh. <laughs> oh my she's goodness. Them back. This is what she does. That if one of them wanders off, magical. she goes and gets them. I know. It's so cool. I oh, love cats. They're this, so awesome. just a, just such an awesome story is, you know, being separated, you know, being found, reunited. And the fact that she just took them on and she's got all the right mama behaviors. Um, I know. It looks a little scary when they're like picking them up. But, um, you know, yeah. it, she's very gentle <laughs> with them. She's like, hey, get back here. I need to lick your head. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have I have just one more question about um, Coco. Uh, sure. who maybe I can get her to scoot in here. Come here, Coco. Coco loves, she's like the star of the show. Um, Coco is, this is my best friend in the world. I love this cat more than I love anything in the world. Um, and she, uh, it makes me so sad that she's on a senior diet now. Cause I want, I want to pretend that she's not a senior, um, but she's 11. So now she mm -hmm. is on the senior consult diet. And since starting that diet, she has become so shiny. She's like, she glows. I'm like, wow, I didn't even notice that her coat condition was not as optimal as it could be until I started her on that diet. So what is in senior food and why is my cat so shiny now? <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy one. Shoot, sure, all right. Um, when it comes to like senior nutrition, the requirements don't necessarily change until there's like a health concern. But there are companies that pay attention to seniors, right? Their bodies are aging. They don't break things down like these to or maybe absorb things. And so, you know, particularly with the diet that she's on, we're really paying attention to the digestibility of the diet. So you know, does she, how hard does her body have to work to get those nutrients or can she spend more time being herself, right? So, I mean, the coat health, it takes a lot of nutrients. And so it's really nicely balanced there to support her in her age, um, the digestibility of the diet, the added um, nutrients in here. So there is some, you know, bone, uh, you know, bone and joint health in that diet as well. Uh, that again, with like the fish oil that's in there, again, amplifying that coat um, and the digestibility, you know, amino acids play a cool role in coat color and bringing that out. Um, and so it, it's really neat to see that happening. We've had black kittens or they almost look brown in rescue. And then we start feeding them proper nutrition. And also you come back and like, well, where are the brown kittens? And they're like, that's them. Like, but they look oil slicked, right? They're just this really nice, shiny, shiny black coat. Yes. <laughs> and it's all about, you know, nutrition um, in, in general, uh, being able to fuel that. And it's, it's really cool to see it happen in front of your eyes. Well, they say you are what you eat and she looks just spectacular. So I am glad that there are people like you 
who <laughs> understand this stuff really well and can translate it for someone like me who obviously I care so much about the well-being of my cats and my kittens but um, you know this is a this is a complex area so I really appreciate you sharing what you know um, and helping all of us learn a little bit more. Um, I just have one last question and it's a would you rather question. It's a very, very awesome. silly one. So um, don't think too hard on it. Just answer which one you think. So the question is, would you rather prepare for yourself a fully loaded, luxurious four course meal, but all of the food has to be in kibble form. So like dry little kibble bits of all of your favorite foods, um, but it's, it's little bits. Or would you rather eat a luxury four course meal of whatever you want, anything, but it was made by a cat? Hmm. I'd probably go by the cat because I'll be honest with you, I am not a very good cook. <laughs> I make a disaster in my kitchen. <laughs> so if I have to prepare it, we're in trouble. So I might trust Dundee at this one. He seems to have impeccable taste. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking like that food looks pretty good, but I'm like, if my cats were preparing me food, there would be a lot of cat hair in it. But also like, let's be real. There's cat food in everything that, or cat hair in everything that I eat. Everything. I have a lot of cats in my house so you know you're gonna eat cat hair sometimes how bad can it be <laughs> yeah nutrients <laughs> well <laughs> well that's getting into a whole other thing and we're not going to talk about the the uh nutrition of eating cat hair but probably not something that you should do uh, but thank you so very much for um all of your wisdom that you shared with us uh, where can people go to learn more about uh, the work that you're doing and the Royal Canaan diets, um, where would you like people to go for more information? Yeah, so when it comes to the nutritional information from Royal Canaan's, they can go right onto our royalcanaan.com website and it will guide you in selecting a diet for your pet and does also cover some of the myths. If you would like some more information about pet food labels and, you know, kind of unraveling that label like you did, um, I do recommend folks going on to the AFCO website because they really do have a nice simplified version of how to read a pet food label. Um, and again, it, it's, it's unsolicited. It's literally just what are the rules out there? And it's always nice to have that guide. And when it comes to choosing a pet food or Googling, right, because Dr. Google can be um, can be a challenge or misleading. Uh, there is a great helpful tool on the Wasava website, so WSAVA.com, um, or I believe it's a .com, but what that will do is that actually has advice for what owners should look for when they're looking for a website to give nutritional information. Again, it's not sponsored by a company. It's literally the, you know, the best of the best in their opinion to help you choose the right spots, right? Because not everything on the internet is true. Um, and so it, it will help with the myth busting uh, and figure out what's what's true for your cat. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much, Bree. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for all of the help that you've um, given me with my kittens and my cats as well. I really appreciate you. And it was great chatting. Yes, thank you so much for uh, having me and I'll live vicariously through you swimming with ducks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Talk right. soon. Bye, Bree. Talk soon. Bye. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. She teaches me a lot and she's been so very helpful with um, you know a lot of the cases I've taken on. So I'm really grateful to her. Thank you everybody for watching. And again, thank you to Royal Canaan for partnering with me. Uh, I want to remind you that you can hop on royalcanon.com slash cat health to learn about the take your cat to the vet campaign. And right now you can actually go on there and um, you can enter the cat to vet sweepstakes. Um, they have uh, all sorts of really cool prizes on there, including uh, what Brie was talking about. Um, the hematuria detection product uh, is available on there. Uh, if you are entering, you are going to get this gift from Royal Canaan. So um, go to royalcanon.com slash cat health to learn more and to participate in the sweepstakes and just to find out how you, know, you can be providing better care to your cats and making sure that you are giving them that veterinary access. Um,
Speaking of veterinary access, my guest next week is my very own personal kitten vet. Uh, her name is Dr. Rachel Wallach, and uh, she's going to be talking with us all about veterinary care for neonatal and special needs kittens. I'm super excited for that. Uh, but that's all for this week. So stay curious, stay compassionate, and join me again next week on Kitten Lady and Friends. Bye, everyone.